Hello and welcome to our second mental health champion session. This time it's on our experiences of COVID and what we have learned so far. We'll be broadcasting this session to coincide with World Mental Health Day on the 10th of October. And this session will be available to view on the council's website and on the YouTube channel later this week. My name is Councillor Anita Sharper and I'm joined by my colleagues, Councillor colleagues, Leslie Heap and Mark Bainham and welcome to you all. I'm also delighted to introduce our panelists this morning. We have Annette Brown, Dr. Joe Steer, and Dr. Phil Moore. And if I may just uh, turn to you, Annette, to start things off, if you could just say a few words, each of you, on your role and what you do, that would be fantastic. Over to you, Annette. Good morning. Um, I'm Annette Brown, and I'm manager of uh, community learning at Kingston Adult Education, where we run lots and lots of courses for residents in Kingston, but my, uh, my main area is mental well-being, and we're offering lots of free courses to vet residents. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Over to you, Jo. Good morning. My name's Dr Jo Steer, and I'm a consultant clinical psychologist and associate director for the Emotional Health Service at Achieving for Children, who provide children's services to Kingston Council. And um, my remit is really to... Um, deliver and run the children and adolescent mental health services that Achieving for Children um, run. So we work very closely with our schools and um, all our local partners to uh, support children and young people's emotional well-being. Thank you so much, Joe. Over to you, Phil. Hi, my name is Phil Moore. I am a GP in the borough of Kingston. Been there for very, very many years and I do a lot of work across London around mental health and mental well-being. I'm part of the steering group for Thrive London, which you may have heard of, and I'm always working to try and improve the services for people who have mental health challenges as well. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, I think what we're going to do is go straight into the questions. We've got seven questions from the public that have been sent in, and we've got a few general comments as well, uh, which we're going to tie into the uh, discussion as we go along. Um, I'm going to read them out in turn, um, and then at the end of the session, I'm going to invite our panellists and councillors, if they wish, to sum up their thoughts on today's session. And so um, if I could, um, first of all, perhaps just get the ball rolling and start with you, Annette. Um, the first question this morning is, um, working from home has made me irritable and sometimes sad for no reason. I have taken up walking, but it takes time. Are there any activities that I can do at home which don't take long and can lift my mood? Over to you, Annette. OK, so um, I think it's really getting into a good routine at home as if you're at work. So um, getting up at the same time every day, uh, planning your diary so that you actually put in a lunch break and some breaks during the day. It's really important. It's very intense otherwise. Um, one, one thing that you could do is I used to walk to work and walk, walk to and from work which is about 45 minutes each day. And I became a bit lazy in that I could get up later. So you could actually still get up a little bit earlier and go for your walk then, because we know that fresh air and exercise is so important for you. If you don't want to go out, another idea I had, um, which I've actually done myself, is to buy an inexpensive, um, you know, one of those cycle things and um, actually almost visualise yourself doing your 10 minutes or 15 minutes before and after work. And I have started doing that when the, when the weather's really disgusting and I do feel better for it. Or do it, you know, there's lots of things online that you can do, you know, do a bit of Joe Wicks if you really want to. Um, but it's it's just really just making sure that you you break up your day. You've got to look after your mental health. And um, by having those regular breaks will help you do that. But exercise is absolutely very important. Absolutely. Thank you, Annette. I think tying in question one and two, because number two is about separating work and home life and how we how we can sort of establish firm boundaries between working and, and family time, personal time. I think that's really important. And I think, Joe, if I can hand over to you, because I think there's an element here about family dynamics as well, isn't there? Absolutely. 
Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, when we were in full lockdown, um, children were at home a lot more. Now, mainly most children are back at school. Um, but obviously, um, different year groups and groups of children may be having periods of self-isolation over the coming weeks and months, um, depending on what's happening in their local area. So it is really important that um, families do have these um, uh, moments where and periods where they can exercise as you said maybe it might be Joe Wicks but it could be um, something else um, uh, a quick walk or even um, some mindfulness practice um, actually that can be really good and it can only take five ten minutes you don't need to spend a long period of time and if you look on YouTube there's lots of um, children's uh, mindfulness practice and um, people will guide you through what to do um, it's just really important though to I suppose when I read the question, it, it talked about um, things that you enjoy. And I thought to myself, well, actually, what, what you could do is to, over a couple of days, see what kinds of activities you've been doing and rate your mood and find out what you enjoy most. So, um, it, you know, when you perhaps you've been on the telephone to a friend, how's your mood out of 10? Is it two out of 10? Has that talking to that friend made you feel really down? Or actually, has it really cheered you up? And are you now an eight out of 10? And what, what I'd suggest is that you, after doing that for a few days, or if a, a week, if you can, you then pick out the things that personally make you feel happier, and try to do more of them, try to schedule them in, so that the um, activities that you enjoy the most you're doing more of and that will help you lift your mood definitely and that can work for children young people and adults absolutely joe i think the family dynamic is so important if if parents and uh, and children during lockdown particularly we're all sort of in the same unit and um i i certainly think even with the best relationships it could be quite trying at times to be around people you love and also you might have situations where it won't be so pleasant for people where there's perhaps relationship breakdown taking place. So absolutely important. Thank you, Joe. And um, Phil, over to you, please, on this one. Thank you. I, I just want to say one or two things in addition to Annette and Joe. Um, it's really important that we all recognise it's been tough. Um, this hasn't been an easy time. And it is OK to have found it tough. Uh, we're not supposed to be superheroes. And it's OK not to be OK about it all. But what we need to try and do is to find some ways that we can get through it. I, there's a great evidence around five things. Two have already been mentioned. One is about being physically active, which Annette spoke about. And that's not about going to the gym. It's about doing a little bit more of the things we do anyway. It's maybe as simple as walking up, up and down stairs two or three times instead of not doing so. Uh, the second thing is being present in the moment or mindfulness which is about not spending all our time worrying about tomorrow or yesterday, but trying to make sure that we're embedded in what we're doing now. And Joe mentioned that. The third thing is make sure we connect with other people because relationships are absolutely vital. Even if it's a matter of picking up the phone, speaking to the neighbor over the fence or in the corridor or in the balcony of your flat, make sure that you just keep that contact with people. Another thing is giving to other people, uh, that, that acts of kindness or volunteering are hugely helpful to our well-being. And there's a huge need for that in the current circumstances, neighbours who need some shopping done. All of those things contribute to our well-being. And the fifth thing is to learn something new. Over the lockdown, I had a little bit of spare time, so I started to do a little bit more DIY around the house. And I found that on YouTube, there's loads of stuff that teaches me new skills that I can access. And we can all do those kind of things. And there's going to be a web link in the notes that, that just give you a link to a site that tells you more about those five things. There's also one that talks about five to thrive for children. And there'll be a link to that one as well. We'll put those on the screen so that you're able to see a little bit more detail about those. So there are things that we can do that aren't difficult that aren't expensive and that really will help us. Thank you, that's excellent. I mean, what, what, what I think comes out of that is this idea about you have to try something to, to know what you like and what you dislike. It's sort of dipping your toes a bit in the water in, an, in a probably an unfamiliar situation that we find ourselves in um, where, where we haven't got that degree of certainty that we used to have about where we're going and future direction. I think the here and now is so important. 
how we look after ourselves and our minds to keep ourselves sort of that health and well-being element to it I think is very very important so thank you both for those for that for those re responses and insights and suggestions um, I'm going to move straight on to the next question which is my 20 year old niece is a student at university and suffers from depression we are worried about her what can what help can she receive during these uncertain times what an, what what an important question i think for a family member to share concern and i think that's probably come out in a lot of um feedback we've been receiving i'm sure over the last few months so if Annette, if i could pass this one to you first thank you this is obviously a, a very pertinent question and it's it's even more worrying when your your child or your family member has has gone away um, so uh, the first thing I would say is that keeping the lines of communication open and that is sometimes quite difficult because it quite often is yourself that's having to do that um, she she needs to know that you're there um, and being in regular contact is one of those things that you need to do and um, all universities should have a student well-being service um, and if she hasn't accessed that um, yet it may be useful if you or a family member can talk to her about that and, and and maybe even and you know offer to help to find out the university won't speak to you directly but you could maybe do it as a, a sort of a joint project with her to sort of help her and then at least it's opening the the lines of communication um, but you do need to be um, really sensitive about how you approach that subject because a lot of people aren't really used to talking about their mental health but it seems that this that your niece has um, one of the things um, that I would say about COVID is that lots more things have come online, which is great. Um, and there are there are many. Um, I mean, I would say to you, for example, we run at Kingston uh, Practical Ideas for Happy Living, which covers the five good things as well as another five. Um, and you can access that online. That's something that she could do online with you. So you could be coming from two different places. And, um, and it's, it may be a really good talking point at the end uh, afterwards, make a date with her and, and then talk about what's been discussed. So there's not just us, there's, there's many other ones. There's another um, organization called Hope and Depression. These are all free um, and they offer, um, they offer people who suffer from depression as well as those carers an understanding about you know the clinical signs of depression the scientific research behind it and what you can do to help so there, there, there are two things um as well as um action of happiness is who we work with and um, they have a really great calendar that you could maybe send to her and um, for example to, this month is optimistic october and today's idea is to do something constructive to improve a diff difficult situation so um that there are there are so many online resources one other thing i just wanted to sort of um point out is that there's a very, there are a couple of really good animated books I've, I've actually got them here one is called living with black dog and one is i had a black dog that's all about depression. Now, these are amazing books. I'm not getting a commission from them, but they are just, you probably can't see this. They're just, there's very few words on them. And um, my friend used this and left it on a coffee table for her son. And her son said, that is exactly how I feel. He actually opened the lines of communication with his mother and it made a massive difference. These books are also, um, they are they are actually animations online on YouTube as well. So that's another thing to think about because sometimes you just can't articulate how you're feeling when you're feeling depressed. Um, so that's it from me and I'll Thank pass you, over to the others. I can only imagine how difficult it is for residents who would write in and obviously all these questions are anonymous. So, you know, when we read them, we can't help but feel for, in some way, for the person who's written them because these are pe real lives and real people's experiences and even though we we can sometimes be a bit detached from it it certainly brings it home to us sometimes that these are real situations that are happening to people in our community so thank you so much Annette for that um over to you Joe on this one thank you um 
So I really um, echo a lot of what um, Annette said. I think um, just thinking about um, not only students, but also children and young people who may be experiencing low yeah, mood or depression um, at the moment. Um, one service that is available locally in Kingston is something called Cooth, which is K-O-O-T-H. Oh, there we go. Phil's put the link up. Brilliant. Um, and um, this is online counselling service, but also online um, chats by qualified counsellors and um, children and young people up to the age of 22 um, from the age of 11 can log on and um, get some advice from qualified counsellors on on the day in the moment or they can have regular online counseling sessions with that service so that's excellent um i think what i'd also say is there's also some really good self-help um books and websites available we've heard a bit already about that from annette but there's something called um books on prescription from um reading well yes. And this is um, a section out their website for um, young people, for children, but also for adults with mental health difficulties. And they have lots of different books on a real range of concerns from low mood and depression, but also to anxiety, self-esteem, how to deal with bullies, things like that for children. And uh, it might be, and often those books are very reasonably priced, but also our local libraries do stock a lot of these books. And so it could be that um, a parent might want to have a look at those and, rec and read them, or a teenager might be able to have a look and start using some of the strategies and advice within those books. Um, Finally, just to add, um, locally at Achieving for Children, we have developed an online resource hub where we've got lots of information and advice and links to other agencies for online counselling. But also we've um, got some videos and um, PowerPoints that we've created with audio. Um, lots of them are aimed at parents. And one of them is um, how to support your child's low mood or depression. So um, it could be that having a look at some of those audios um, and PowerPoints might help some give parents some ideas. Because as you said, Anita, rightly so, it's a really worrying time and parents um, will be worried um, if their child is low and how to get them support. And we know um, that there is pressure on children's mental health services so whilst you're often having to wait for appointments it's important that you can have other things to do in the meantime which this self-help um, material can can do can support with really thank you joe i think it's so important as well with the uncertainty around covid that parents don't know really if their children will be self-isolating in a in the halls of residence or you know imagine if it's your first year at university and everything's new there's there's so much uncertainty and anxiety i think on on both the, the person who's experiencing these low moods and where to go for help but also the parents must be worried as well about naturally about what's happening so thank you so much joe um over to you phil thank you Thank you, uh, Anita. I'm so sorry to hear about your niece, because the last thing oh, you want. Sorry, may I, may I just say it, it's not. Um, it was a. It's a resident, obviously using the and, first term of their niece. So I just that, wanted to fine. make that. I wasn't your niece. I was meeting, talking to the people who are out there. Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry to hear about your niece. Um, the last thing you want when you're 20 years old and off to university and all the fun and challenges of that life to suddenly find that you're depressed it, it is like going through hell and i am so sorry to hear about it so what can you do i think the first thing that you can do is you can be one of the things that help to maintain well-being and that is you can be one of her connections and make sure that you stay in touch and in doing that validate how she's feeling because when we get depressed there's several things we do we withdraw from other people because we can't quite cope with that. And we also feel that we're probably the only person in the world that's feeling like this. And sometimes it helps just to have how we're feeling validated and say it's okay, uh, but there is a way out of this. And there are services in every university, usually multiple services that students can access. They can go to the university services, 
or they can go to their GP, or they can self-refer to what is called IAPT, or Improving Access to Psychological Therapies, in every area. There are online things in Couth, things like Couth, that's available in Kingston and many other areas, and others like it as well. Another one that's available if you live in London is Good Thinking, and there's a website there where you can get some support and help. So there's lots of things that they can be encouraged to do, but the biggest problem is when you feel depressed, you don't want to do any of it. And what you need is people around you who will support you and encourage you and validate you and help you to feel motivated enough to go and get that, that help. If the depression doesn't begin to settle, very important that she talks to her GP and that her GP can help her and either decide how to manage that or get her to the right kind of services that can assist her. And there is a way through this. You do get out of this. It's not permanent, and it's important that people understand that when they're going through it. So I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Phil. I think I think motivation to try and help and have that support network around somebody is so important. So thank you so much for that advice. Um, if I can go on to the next question. Um, this question, um, I'm actually going to go straight to Annette for, which is, I know an elderly friend who lives um, on her own and she likes being socially active. She uses the internet to talk to her family and friends what help in the community is available for people who live by themselves? I thought this was an interesting question from perhaps a neighbour or perhaps somebody who knows somebody who's elderly. So over to you, Annette, on this one. Thank you. So that I think this, uh, this is very common uh, for everybody to feel a bit socially isolated. The, the good thing is that um, your neighbour or... Um, actually has access to online because there's an awful lot of um, computer poverty within the borough so um, what we've found at, um, in adult education is whilst we're offering courses there's a lot, lot of people that actually don't have access to computers to even access any of the services um, and we're looking at ways of supporting them. Um, there are a couple of um, organisations that you might not think would be appropriate um, Princess Alice Hospice actually offers a compassionate neighbour programme and it's not just for people that have got a terminal illness, it's for anybody. Um, they've opened up their doors and um, they have trained volunteers who will phone around, um, sometimes meet um, and you can actually self-refer to that. So you can refer somebody to that and um, they can, you know, <clears throat> at the moment, I think it's offering a cup of tea over the the phone so having a tea and chat really so that's one organization um, and I, as, again we'll at the at the end of the session we can put those uh, details on the other one is um, a, an organization that I came across was Fulham teammates and again it's not just for young aspiring uh, footballers and um, they are offering online coffee mornings and social evenings um, and you can even um, do some quizzes sort of tea in a chat as well they will do not just groups but they will do one-to-one -one as well. So um, that's something that they're offering. Um, so although there are, I know that there are, you know, between the sort of voluntary se sectors um, within Kingston, there are other um, organisations, they are too. Um, the other thing I would say is that we have lots of um, things from Kingston Adult Education, again, that we're offering. Um, just some people... We were, we were quite surprised at how many people wanted to do online courses, but I think it's because when the, when you have to isolate, you need people. And um, as Dr. Moore said, that actually you really do need people, whether it's important to see that person in pers uh, person, but actually if you can't, even online, connecting through the online community. Thank you so much, Annette. I'd, I mean, how interesting that the Fulham teammates <laughs> sticks in my mind. Um, I think it's just great initiatives. You know, people are thinking about people in the community who perhaps are self-isolating or, as we say, might be feeling a bit isolated themselves. And I think linking up with other people in, in the community is so important, you know, keeping that communication going and finding innovative ways of 
keeping ourselves busy and learning new things. So thank you so much, Renette. I'm going to go uh, pass on to Phil for this to answer this bit of the question. Thanks. Over to you. Thanks, Anita. You know, all of us have felt isolated to some degree, even if we've got lots of relationships. Uh, both my kids and my grandchildren are at the other side of the Atlantic, and we've felt the distance quite often. So I can't imagine what it's like if you're on your own and really isolated like that. And there are things you can do. You've heard some suggestions. But one other thing is every group of practices, uh, general practices that are close to you, will have somebody called either a social prescriber or a community connector who can help you with advice about where you can get those contacts that will really help you not to be so isolated. So a practical suggestion, if you're getting stuck, talk to your local practice and ask if you can speak to the social prescriber or the community connector, and they can help you put, be put in touch with them so they can give you some advice. Thank you so much, Phil. And I believe we've got um, also, I think, Connected Kingston as well, which was is our um, platform, if you like, to log on and all, lots of useful tips and advice and links, I believe. So um, excellent. Thank you so much, Phil, for that. Um, so straight on to the next question. Interesting one, this one. I have kept my job, but I feel guilty for those who have lost their incomes and livelihoods. Is this a normal reaction? And I, when I read the question, I thought, I, what an interesting question, and, and I'm pleased that somebody posed it, because um, if I can um, turn to you, Annette, on this one, see what your thoughts are on, on this question. I think um, what we have to acknowledge is that this, this situation has brought up so many emotions, um, and it can be from anger to upset to worry to anxiety. Um, so what I would say is that it is that reaction is is can be quite normal and those negative feelings can arise from any kind of trauma um, or a perceived injustice or in the world. And at the moment for that, it, it is um, it is for those of us that might feel unaffected from COVID. Thank God for some of us. Um, for, from my perspective, while, whilst it's quite normal, it is important to look, not let this get out of hand. And that maybe that this is a time to focus um, where that negative feeling is coming across and, and making and doing something positive. So it might be helping in the community. So whilst you might, and, and it's not just to be sort of patronizing or to make yourself feel, feel better, but, but you're actually doing something positive because quite often one of the things that happens when we're not when when something bad is happening is because we feel out of control and it's about how to how we can control things. We can't control that, but we can maybe take control of our feelings. So um, there are always there's so many charities always looking for volunteers. Uh, for example, Kingston Churches for Action Against Homelessness, uh, Volunteer in Kingston, Kingston Stronger, Stronger Together, KVA. If you look on their websites, they all have initiatives of where you can manage collecting food from distributing food to, um, again, visits, tea and chats. Um, it might be just virtual chats, but actually just trying to help support those people that are actually less fortunate than yourself. Thank you so much, Annette. I think that's very important about this idea of looking at into the community uh, for that link to see whether there's anything um, we can do. Um, and if I can uh, go to you, Jove, on this one, thank you. Yes, I think um, I would echo what Annette says, really, that it's very normal to have these feelings um, at the moment. You're definitely not alone in feeling this way. Um, and guilt um, for all sorts of different reasons will be popping up. Um, uh, another example might be as a parent who um, has to work and their children are perhaps off for self-isolating and they have to just put them in front of the television because they've got some important work to get through or some video calls and that parent might feel really guilty about that. But actually um, it's so important to be kind to yourself and to think about well, actually, what am I doing? I'm modeling to my children that um, you need to work hard 
and that you have to make the best of a difficult situation and get through it somehow. And if that means that they have to watch a couple of hours of CBBS in order for me to be able to do this work, then that is what has to happen. And so I suppose being kind to yourself and um, how you talk to yourself and how you think about things is really important because the way that we think affects how we feel. So the feeling is the guilt, but it's the thought behind that that maybe needs a, a little bit more unpicking or um, thinking about really. So uh, yeah, being kind to yourself is a really important message and um, talking to other people, being connected as we've heard, but also thinking about how much you are watching or reading on social media and the television, because actually the news and all of the social media feeds uh, really, really can reinforce some of these feelings of guilt. They can make you feel quite guilty about lots of different things. So actually, if that's something that's becoming a bit of a problem for you, maybe just keep an eye on how much you are on social media. Try and turn it down a notch, perhaps have a little bit of a few days off from it um, and see if that makes a difference to help with some of those difficult feelings. Thank you so much, Joe, for that. Um, over to you, Phil. I just want to say absolutely normal. Um, this is nothing unusual and it's got a generic term. We talk about survivor guilt. I don't know if you've ever heard that term. People who have been in a situation with other people and other people have suffered more than they have, they can often feel this feeling of survivor guilt. Absolutely normal. Joe and Annette have given very good suggestions as to how to work through it. Just to add, if it's not settling, do get some help because this is very, very uh, able to be treated by normal psychological interventions, talking treatments. And I'm going to put a link in the, 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 the screen to a website that tells you a little bit more about survivor guilt so you can understand it a little bit more. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, I am conscious about the time. So so we do have two questions left, so I'm just going to uh, cover them. Uh, the second to last question is, people who, this is an interesting one, people who break social distancing rules make me so angry. I, am I becoming an intolerant person? Um, in these strange times, we, I never thought we would actually have, have situations where we have to walk around with masks on. It, it can feel quite surreal. So Annette, if you've got some thoughts on this one, please, over to you. Well, this is a real emotive subject um, because we can all perceive the guidance in, in so many different ways. And, and, and maybe there's some really deep rooted anxieties anyway going on with us, even though we think that we're doing everything right. Um, so what we what we need to be be you've got every right to be fearful if somebody's not, you know, practicing social distancing um, or wearing coverings. Um, but and whether you respond to somebody not being sensible um, is a very personal choice. But the way you do it is re really matters. Um, and you really shouldn't be obnoxious or get nasty because getting angry at the situation um, is only really affecting you in the long run. You're just going to go home and you're going to be fueling your anxieties and, and, and be stressed and angry um so it, it but it's important therefore but before reacting to cry tight cry sorry try and take a breath and change your mindset by asking yourself is there a reason for example why this pe person isn't wearing a covering because many are exempt from you know because of health issues whether it's a respiratory illness or they've got a learning disability or they've got a um, speech or hearing impediment and they don't think they're going to be heard so it's and um, you know they would really struggle to be understood so it's really important to ask yourself those questions and um, the other thing is that somebody may simply have just been absent-minded about not being social distant social distancing <laughs> I've probably done it and I'm really cautious so I think that you have to maybe in a subtle way uh, make it obvious that you're practicing so safe distancing and sometimes people go oh yes okay yeah I need to be two meters apart or whatever um, and finally maybe if that's happening frequently in a shop just maybe speaking to the management and saying, look, I'm really not, I know there's one particular shop I'm thinking of, not going to mention any names, that it is not great. So maybe what I need to do is go and speak to the management and say, you know, this is, this is all a bit mad at the moment. And maybe, you know, you need to sort of announce your restrictions more. So it's just a couple of practical ideas, really. 
Thank you, Annette. That's very, that's a very, very, very useful point. I think people sometimes would, it's very quick to react and actually might be better just to take a step back and, and look at the situation before um, sort of making up a firm opinion. So, um, Joe, your thoughts on this one? Thanks. Yeah, not, not too much to add, really. I think similarly, um, it's really understandable that people might feel angry. Um, but probably um, underneath that anger is anxiety and worry about, gosh, they're too near to me. What happens if if I've now caught COVID? Um, and so taking that deep breath is important, taking a step back and having a moment, because actually, um, as Annette's already said, there are lots of people that are exempt from wearing masks. Um, I would also add um, children, you know, obviously children of, under a certain age, but also um, young people who have autism spectrum disorder are also exempt. And that's not something that is uh, visible or immediately um, uh, you wouldn't know. So therefore, you can think, well, why have they not got their mask on? But actually, there is a really good reason for that. And I know lots of people are wearing lanyards that indicate that, but not everybody is able to or has one available. So, yeah, definitely just think it may well be justified their behaviour. Um, I think we're in a situation, it feels like um, we don't have much control at times. And um, certainly as um, changes come in and different restrictions uh, come into place or are lifted, we all, I know, um, people are saying they feel very unsettled by that. And they feel like they've just got used to something and then it changes again. And that's quite hard. And it does mean that we're all feeling anxious, a lot more anxious than we would normally feel. And so more sensitive to what other people are doing and what's going on around us. But yeah, it's just trying to be thoughtful about that. But where appropriate, absolutely giving feedback to people in a calm, <laughs> measured way. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, any thoughts on this one, Phil? <laughs> yeah, just, just to say that being angry is a completely normal human reaction. We all get it. And being angry doesn't make us intolerant. It's what we do with the anger that makes us intolerant uh, if we behave in particular ways. And what brilliant advice from Annette and Joe about things that we can do. Two suggestions from me about things that I do when I become angry. It's the first thing is I say, well, have I never bent the rules? Uh, maybe not in this area, but probably I've done things often that other people would be angry about as well. And the second thing is to recognize that majority of us, the vast majority of us, are not lawbreakers. We are absent-minded, thoughtless, sometimes irritable, sometimes bullshit, and we will go and do things for something that has happened outside of that situation. And so I ask myself, I wonder what those people have, have had in their lives that have precipitated this. Are they worried about someone? Are they going out? to shop for a neighbor and not thinking about what they're doing. If they've got a relative who's got COVID-19, what's going on? And that often helps me to be a lot more tolerant than otherwise I might be, even though I'm angry. So maybe that will help you. Thank you, Phil, very much indeed for that. And our last question, I'm actually going to get Phil, Phil uh, this one for you, Phil, which is, um, I've been, dis I've seen um, distressed patients in Kingston Hospital when I was went to A&E, so I can only imagine what this person had an emergency of some kind. Is there anything that can be done to ease people's anxiety? A dedicated mental health nurse to watch and see what's happening. I thought that was an interesting question, as obviously I, I personally haven't been to A&E at all, so. Um, uh, not for a long time. So I wouldn't be able to say myself what it must be like, but it must be lots of anxious people milling around and wanting to get uh, someone seen, you know, to be seen quickly. So I don't know, Phil, if you've got any thoughts on this one. Yes, I've got one of your thoughts on this. And uh, I had a bit of personal experience right in the middle of the lockdown. I had an event that took me off in a, an ambulance to A&E in the middle of all of this. Now, because I'm familiar with hospitals, I wasn't too bothered, but my wife was very, very worried about me going off to A&E. So I can understand people being really, really anxious about being in the midst of all this often chaotic activity and worried about who's got some uh, condition like COVID-19 I might get and all the rest of it. And that's perfectly understandable. One of the things to know is that every accident and emergency department have access to a... a um, 
uh, a liaison service with mental health trained people who are available. They're not sitting in A&E all the time watching people because that, that would be an expensive resource that would be really quite difficult to afford. However, they are available. And my experience is that A&E staff are very good at watching for people who are becoming anxious and becoming agitated. And if they spot it, they have immediate access to those mental health nurses and other trained people who can come and actually help with that individual if they need some more specialist help. Often what somebody in that situation needs is just a bit of reassurance and somebody talking to them and spending a little bit of time with them. And I know A&E staff are very busy. It's been pretty hectic at times, but they're very good at getting that personal attention where it's needed and have access to specialist help should that individual need a bit more than just that human contact with a member of A&E staff. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, I think uh, just at this stage, I just wanted to say um, if anybody had any questions that they wanted to ask, uh, please do so or put them in the chat box. Um, uh, otherwise, um, I really just wanted to say thank you. And perhaps we can just do a very brief summing up um, of your thoughts from today's session. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit of summing up myself. But Annette, if I could, if a few words from you just to sum up would be very, very uh, helpful. Thank you so much. Um, what, what I'd just like to say is that um, there are so many anxieties and worries around COVID and, that, and, you know, that is perfectly normal. But I would say my final point is to maybe treat yourself how you would treat a good friend. You know, if if some, if they're feeling low or whatever, just ask yourself, what would you what would you say to them? And it might be you might say, come on, you know, it's OK. Yeah, you, you know, you messed up today. It's all right. You know, everybody makes mistakes. Think about think about what good you've done. Um, it's really important. We are our, we are the best critic, but the worst critic in a way, because we're always we, we quite often will think about all the things that we've done wrong and not necessarily the things we've done right and how we've reacted. So, you know, it's OK to reflect on your day, but make sure you think about the good things that you've done and treat yourself. You know, and, and whether that is some me time, because when you've got your family around you, it's very, very hard. But even if it is going into the bath and sitting in the bath with a candle, you know, for 10 minutes, just having some new time. It's really important because one of the things they say, you know, about on an aeroplane, you know, you put your oxygen mask on first because if you're not OK, other people aren't going to be OK. So so please look after yourself. Thank you, Annette. I'm, and apologies, uh, Mark, I did see a question you wanted to ask in the chat box. So before we go over to you, Joe, if I could just uh, uh, quickly um, uh, uh, ask Mark if you could just ask your question now would be fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And thanks very much, uh, Annette, Phil and Joe. It's been really interesting and I think really helpful as well. Um, so just very quickly, in terms, I know we talked about the struggles of COVID, but what do you think are the positives we can take out of this experience for people going forward? Uh, with regards to our mental health. Um, yeah, I don't know who wants to, say, wants to say that first, but thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So what I might do, Joe, is just quickly zip back to you, Annette, because I think that really sort of probably echoes what you were saying just now about wanting to have some time that we give to ourselves. Would you say that probably is um, what you said about answering Mark's question? Um, yes, definitely. I think that even for myself that I've learned that, you know, in the busyness of everything, that it's actually taking time to see what really matters and the things that you, you don't need to do. So it's that, that that's really important. You know, one of the things that we all had to do is when we couldn't go out is try and, you know, if you're lucky enough to be able to have a garden to actually, you know, go out and listen to the birds or whatever, or to be able to walk to the park or walk to an open space. But actually looking at what really matters and what really does matter quite often are the people around you, surrounding you, if you're lucky enough to have that. Thank you, Annette. And Joe, if I could um, um, over to you really just for some words and thoughts about today's session. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, sure. I mean, just to pick up a little bit um, on Mark's question, I think yeah. one of the positives um, for, that I've noticed is that services have actually adapted so well to the situation. And so 
um, and we and because we've had to so we're now able to provide a lots of support online and this isn't something that we were doing at all um, in January where now we can offer online therapy online assessments for children and young people um, and it's made us do it at a very swift pace uh, and actually, I think that's a good thing because uh, it gives families and people more choice and options. Um, so, so that's definitely been been a positive. Um, in terms of summing up the session, I think it's been uh, really um, excellent to hear hear everyone's views and advice. Lots of amazing advice for people. Um, I think for me, I would just emphasise um, for parents. The, the importance of looking after yourself, because as Annette says, uh, your own mental health influences those around you. And we know that as a parent, if you are feeling very, very anxious or very low, it will have an impact on your child. Um, and so it's really important that you can get some help um, from your GP and from other services so that um, you can can do carry on doing the great job that you're doing as a parent really um and also if you were worried about your child please do go and connect and talk to people whether that's your gp or their school all the schools in kingston are so delighted to have reopened and welcomed back all their students they're so happy all the heads to have everyone back in and um i know that they would uh, be happy to support any family that's struggling and um, give some advice and signpost them on if they need to. So please do speak to school, particularly if attendance is an issue, if you're worried and it feels like it's really hard to get your child in at the moment, for whatever reason it might be, please, please just talk to them because there are lots of services that are out there ready um, and willing to help. Yeah. Thank you so much, Joe. very much indeed. And finally to you, Phil. Thank you. What, what fabulous advice from Annette and Joe. That's really, really good stuff. I've not got a lot to add. I just want to say a couple of things that maybe will help us. First thing, we need to give ourselves permission not to be OK. All of the evidence shows in any major event like this, whether it's a disaster or something like a pandemic, it is a normal human reaction to be distressed. But the really good news is the vast, vast, vast majority of us get through that. After two or three weeks, we, we will get through that acute distress and we'll find a level that enables us to cope. For the few who don't manage that, that's not something that's wrong with you. It's just your specific reaction has been more prolonged. And that's an indication you should seek some additional help Give your permission, self permission not to be okay, but then say, I'm not gonna stay here, I'll get some help from somebody somewhere. What's good to come out of this? I think the main thing for me is a re-emphasis on community. We found our communities afresh very often. We found our neighbors, we had contact when we used to go out and clap in the evenings. We had a lot more contact with neighbors than we've had for perhaps many years in many cases. And I think community is one of our biggest protective factors in terms of our mental well-being. I'm delighted that we've rediscovered that and we have to take very stringent measures to make sure we don't lose it again. That'd be my view. Thank you so much, Phil. I think if, and, and I really just want to say finally, a big thank you to everybody who's participated today. Thank you all for your, for your really good advice, your tips, your suggestions. Thank you for the links that have come up on the screen. Um, I hope our listeners have found this as interesting as I found it. And also I think to just emphasize that COVID is not an easy time for many of us. And, you know, I think, um, as we look as we look to our family and friends and, and the wider network for help, sometimes this doesn't happen smoothly or in the way that we expect. But equally, we can look to the positives of a situation. I think what I've heard from today is there's a range of, you know, professional help and support out there. Um, importantly, the emphasis of let's keep talking about mental health and about looking at the positives of what we can do for ourselves and looking after ourselves, I think is key. As Joe was saying about parents and Phil and Annette, you've mentioned about you know all the help that's available, but also about 
you know, we're our individuals and also, you know, we're in family d dynamics and we, ha we know of friends who might be suffering. So I think that sense of community is so important. So um, a huge thank you to everybody. Um, and it's been immensely enjoyable having this session today. Um, please stay safe, everyone. Keep well. And, um, and we hope to invite you back soon for any further sessions that we can have. So thank you all very much indeed.